the Penn State Nittany Lions may be the happiest team of them all, that the Big Ten no longer has the East Division, and that the playoff has expanded from four teams to 12 teams. But can they take that next step up the college football ladder? Zach Seiko of Locked On Nittany Lions joins me to break down all things 2024 Penn State football. From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten 10. All they do is win 10 games. Penn State has been a pretty good model of consistency over the years under James Franklin, but can they get over that hump? That is the question that everybody around Happy Valley wants to know. To preview all things Penn State 2024 football season, we welcome in our guy Zach Seiko from Locked On Nittany Lines to break it all down. You know, when you lose two coordinators, Zach, at a program like maybe a Penn State, you might think, well, that's just the nature of doing business. That's the nature of winning 10 football games. But maybe it's a little bit more complicated for the Penn State Nittany Lions. You look at things on the defensive side of the ball, yeah. You'll look at a really good defensive coach in Manny Diaz. He goes to get a head coaching opportunity at Duke. He coached a fantastic defense last year at Penn State. But you look at the offensive side of the ball, and it's a little bit different. Mike Yersich does not finish the season, and now they bring in a new offensive coordinator, who a lot of people are excited about, in Andy Kotelnicki. How does the story of the moving musical chairs of these coordinators kind of tell what could happen here as we look forward to 2024? Yeah, if you're losing your offensive coordinator or any of your coordinators by choice— And that isn't exactly a good thing in college or pro athletics. And Mike Yersich wasn't getting the results. Uh, Drew Aller was inconsistent, right? There's the good stats that people will cling to. I'll cling to it. But Mike Yersich wasn't getting the full results of an offense that should have been better. Mandy Diaz, a rock star as an offensive coordinator, right? Uh, Penn State was number one in a lot of defensive metrics, led the nation in a lot of different categories, and he moves on, and Penn State gets an upgraded offensive coordinator. I don't know about a significant drop-off from Manny Diaz to Tom Allen, I, right. e- even if it is a drop-off. It, it's hard to match the you know the number one or a top-five status of what Manny Diaz's defenses were in this past season, but Tom Allen – is a defensive mastermind, and I think him moving away from the head coaching spot will actually benefit him. A lot of people say for Penn State to really make that next jump as a football team, it's offense that needs to make that next jump, and we want to start with Andy Kotelnicki coming in because a lot of people believe that Andy and his creativity coming over from Kansas could maybe be that missing piece for this offense to really take a big step up and maybe be one of the Big Ten's best offenses here in 2024. What gives you confidence that Andy Kotelnicki is a significant upgrade over what ha- what Penn State has had at this OC spot in the past? Uh, for a few things. Part of it is circumstantial. Part of it is Andy Kotelnicki himself. So Kotelnicki is a breath of fresh air. Wherever he's been, he's been successful. He's also able to do more with less. Okay. At Buffalo, those offenses were really good in respect to the Mac. Kansas had a top 10 ground game. And I know Big 12 defenses, I get that. But this was Kansas. Andy Kotelnicki was able to make their third string walk-on quarterback look good when the first and second string quarterbacks were hurt, the walk-on was able to run the offense. So now you have a five-star quarterback. Now you have a five-star running back and a high-end four-star in Kate Allen. But Singleton and Allen are essentially, they're different running backs, but they're the same overall kind of caliber. You're getting a, a really good one-two punch there rather than just Devin Neal at, at Kansas. And the wide receivers, I mean, Kansas made their wide receivers look very good in this past season. So you're just getting a new, different look kind of offense in the Big Ten. You're getting Andy Kotelnicki, who just understands, loves football, and gets to do more with more now. You're also not facing a defensive guy outside of Ohio State. The other top teams in the Big Ten, as far as defenses go, Michigan, Iowa, Nebraska. I know they still got to play Wisconsin. 
But other than Ohio State and Wisconsin, you're not facing this gauntlet of defensive juggernauts. Let's talk about Drew Aller because I look at and the first bullet point I have here is highs and lows. It started off really high. Remember in that West Virginia game to open the season, it rears back and throws that big touchdown pass to open up the season. But then we talked about those Michigan games. We talked about those Ohio State games. And that might not be completely on 15 in blue and white, but still as a quarterback, you're going to take the brunt of that. How important is that marriage for Drew Aller to really take that next step in this offense this year? There's definitely, there's more components to this of, well, Drew Aller's bad or he's not developing or he's, he's still developing. I, this, this was new information to me throughout last season. Drew Aller just hasn't been playing quarterback for a long time. I think Drew Aller had a good season. That's a first-year college starter. He's 19 years old, turning 20 now, going into his third year, and just hasn't had a long track record of playing quarterback. Plus, you had an offensive coordinator that just, you have a five-star quarterback, and you continually took the football out of his hands. So that is going to lead to rhythm issues, confidence confidence issues. Andy Kotal Nicky said all the right things right out of the gate. You know, it it, yeah. it only matters until it actually happens. But he said, we need to get Drew Aller going. We need to get quick passes that just build him confidence. And you look back at the tape and it's like, yeah, that wasn't really happening when it mattered most. Congratulations. You could do it against UMass, West Virginia, like you mentioned, right. and any Delaware, all, all the other opponents where it was inconsequential. Part of it is coaching. Part of it is, yeah, Drew Aller needs to own up to those mistakes. I think just the way he was coached, protect the football. Protect the football, lean on the ground game, and a top five defense, and everything will be okay. Well, that got Penn State only so close. If Penn State is going to win those games, be a difference maker in the college football playoff, you can't have your quarterback, your five-star quarterback, being a glorified game manager. Drew Aller has to be able to lead comebacks, and be able to convert those, you know, third down and not so manageables because it seemed like a lot of drives, just too many drives would stall for Penn State, and eventually the defense would break. If the offense was able to bail out the defense a little bit, Penn State's defense could have been even better for the amount of time that it was on the football field because of the ineptness of last year's offense. I want to go to the wide receiver position because that was a big talking point for the Nittany Lions during this offseason. I essentially look at a swap at the top. You lose Keandre Lambert-Smith. He transfers out. He goes to Auburn. You bring in Julian Fleming. He comes over from Ohio State. A couple of years back when he was paired with C.J. Stroud, he did a pretty good job stretching the field for this Ohio State offense. Maybe not so much his numbers went a little bit down with Kyle McCourt, as did a lot of Ohio State's passing game, receiving game. What gives you confidence that Julian Fleming is going to be that true number one guy that maybe Keandre Lambert Smith wasn't be able wasn't able to really get to and maybe if it's not Julian who else could really step up in this wide receiver room for the Penn State I don't know that I necessarily see a true bona fide number one wide receiver on this team you have a lot of good college football wide receivers that other name to know is Trey Wallace Wallace battled at Harrison Wallace the third for anybody that wants his full name but he goes by Trey Wallace Uh, so Trey was supposed to kind of be the one that took the torch away from Keandre Lambert Smith they were kind of a 1a and 1b and they were waiting for Wallace to eventually turn the corner and Wallace battled injuries was in and out of the lineup and then missed a majority of time down the second half of the season and never got to establish himself Why I like Julian Fleming is not because he is going to be someone that defenses have to game plan for. He's going to keep defensive coordinators up at night. He's just not that. He hasn't lived up to that potential. I don't know what that was. A lot of that, I think, has to do with injuries. He's never been, at least from what he's admitted in interviews, that he's never been fully healthy. Mm. He says, again, he's saying all the right things. Andy Kotelnik, he's saying all the right things. It only matters until it actually happens. But Julian Fleming says that he is the healthiest he's ever been. He feels the best that he's ever been. So that's great news for Penn State. Maybe he can actually start to turn in that form, former four, five-star wide receiver, one of the best in the nation that Ohio State was able to go into Pennsylvania and get that commitment. What I like about Julian Fleming is that he is going to get the wide receiver room into shape. Julian Fleming offers more than just on-field production. And I think his value of being a leader in the locker room being an example for the younger wide receivers. Because last year, Ted, this is what I heard, was that 
the wide receiver room was just show punch in for your nine to five and punch out. Nobody mm. did any extra work uh, after yeah. practice. Nobody did any extra work in the film room. And it showed you got, you know, yeah, it, they met the bar. And then when Will Johnson or Denzel Burke were in the lineup, everybody disappeared. So Dante Cephas, Keandre Lambert Smith, they're not on the team for a reason. And where I see a lot of value in him is also the ground game. He was the second best graded run blocker on Ohio State as a wide receiver from a season ago. So if he can, part of the reason Penn State's ground game was not as good as it was in 2022 with two freshman running backs, how did Singleton and Allen not get better in their second year? Because the wide receiver blocking was mm. bad. Julian Fleming is a phenomenal run blocker and will essentially act as an extra tight end, an extra lineman out on the boundary. I really love Tyler Warren um, at the tight end position. I think when a lot of people talk about Big Ten tight ends, they talk about national tight ends, right? In all of college football, they talk about the Colson Lovesons at Michigan, Luke Lachey's at Iowa, you know, those types of guys. But I think Tyler Warren maybe deserves to be in that discussion, right? You look at what Tyler was able to do last season. He caught seven touchdowns, maybe being a little bit overlooked at that tight end spot. Whether it's Tyler and maybe this whole tight end room, how do they blend into what Penn State is going to look like offensively in 2024? So Andy Kotelnicki is an offensive line tight ends guy. Like that was that is his background. That he is the normally that his bias is going to be towards. Hey, we're going to ground and pound the football, and the tight end's going to get the football. Tyler Warren has always been overshadowed because yes, he was a younger player in the locker room, but there was Brenton Strange who ended up being a second round pick, yep. Theo Johnson who ended up being a fourth round pick. All on the same timeline, Strange just, you know, a year ahead, Theo Johnson a year ahead, right type of thing. But now Warren, I don't want to say is all by himself. Like there's plenty of, plenty of good, other good, and project as better tight end prospects in the future, if you can believe that. Luke Reynolds is a five-star. Yep. He's a true freshman. But that's just, but Tyler Warren doesn't have to share the workload anymore. He's not a co-starter with Theo Johnson. He's not a co-co-starter with Brenton Strange and Theo Johnson. It's Tyler Warren first and then the other backup tight ends. So Penn State, I'm sure, will factor in. They'll run two tight end sets. They might even run three tight ends. They have good quality substitutes, but Tyler Warren is the guy, and there isn't this debate, okay, who's the co-starter? Who's going to get more looks this day? It is Tyler Warren. Tyler Warren... We talk about the wide receivers themselves. How about we group them together as pass catchers? Tyler Warren, at the end of the day, might be your leading receiver. And frankly, because of Andy Cotal Nicky's background, how good Tyler Warren is, and Drew Aller already having that mutual relationship with Tyler Warren, Warren could set Penn State school records for the tight end position. I think that's what's going to happen career, single season. Tyler Warren, he stays healthy for 12 plus games. Tyler Warren will end up in the record books for a lot of categories when it comes to the tight end position at Penn State. For all those reasons you mentioned, he's got to be in that same conversation as maybe some of the top tight ends in the Big Ten. Did we bury the lead a little bit? Maybe. But Nick Singleton and Katron Allen in the run game, to me, it's slightly insane that these guys maybe flew under the radar a little bit in the Big Ten and maybe nationally last year because they combined for over 1,600 yards – and 16 touchdowns in a down year, maybe compared to what they did as freshmen uh, the year before. Uh, when you look at this run game, what needs to happen for these two to maximize their potential, specifically looking at Nick Singleton to maybe get, th get back to that explosiveness that we saw during his freshman campaign? Well, we've already discussed it. The wide receiver blocking helps. Julian Fleming being in there, that it allows running plays to extend. This is truly thunder and lightning. Katron Allinger, thunder. Nicholas Singleton is your lightning. And their usage is truly 50-50. Like it, it, it is split down the middle. There isn't one, you know, single. hey, Singleton's getting 60%. Allen's getting 40%. That is by design. That's also the fact that they complement each other so well. And they're just talented because, like you said, 1600 plus yards well they're never going to be in the they, they will be in the all-america conversation naturally the heisman conversation just because yeah they're phenomenal athletes and they will be solid nfl prospects probably second or third round picks at the end of the day we'll see what they do this season maybe they play their way back into a first round conversation but they're four five star and a former high-end four star in katron allen 
these two, if they were one running back, would be a Heisman contender. Yeah. It's because they split reps that they take away. Well, they're not all American caliber. They're not Heisman. Yeah, because they they, they essentially undermine their campaigns. <laughs> That's what they do. But that is because Penn State wants to have them. Notice how both of them stayed healthy the entire season. They both, yeah. because they're not running the tread on the tires. They complement each other well. And then you can use both of them strategically. And James Franklin has said that we want both of our running backs to be as close to 100% as possible going into the fourth quarter, and they got that every single game of the season. Let's head to the offensive line, because if those backs are going to have that great year, it's going to be up to the big boys up front uh, to really pave the way. Of course, Olu Fashano is an NFL player, first-round uh, NFL draft pick on that offensive line. And then when you kind of look at what's coming back, you got two guys that were honorable mention, all Big Ten, including Sal Warmly uh, over there, started thir to all 13 games at right guard last season. You look at Nolan Rucci, who was highly rated from Wisconsin, didn't really work out in Madison. Now he's coming in, maybe projected to be a starter on this Nittany Lions offensive line this season. How do you see all of these moving parts gelling together up front? I, I would say the offensive line is one of my biggest concerns for this Penn State team. Okay. And they were good. They were okay to slightly above average last season. I know they had Olu Fashionu. I, but they they didn't and I again I think part of that has to do with scheme I think Mike you're such affected a lot of position groups that just it it's only going to show up so much and offensive line doesn't show up in the box score you have to right. look at pro football focus you have to watch tape to actually understand what's going on here but let's look at it this way Ted Olu Fashionu was a top 15 pick Hunter Norzad was uh, I think a fifth round pick maybe he was a sixth it's it's slipping my mind and Caden Wallace was a third round pick. Yep. So everyone liked to harp on Caden Wallace saying he wasn't that good. He should be benched. And he ends up becoming a day two NFL draft pick by the New England Patriots. So now you're losing three NFL veterans on a line that was okay to slightly above average. Logically, that's not good. Okay. And I look at this offensive line, you know, there's Sal Wormley comes back. You have J.B. Nelson, who was really good a season ago and was in and out of the lineup with some injuries, but ultimately was another good complementary part to this line. I look at the – and Nolan Rucci comes in, didn't work out Wisconsin. He's added about 10, 12 pounds of good weight, 15 pounds of good weight, and, and that bodes well for Penn State. But you have a new blindside left tackle. You don't have that chemistry that you had before. You have a new center and most likely Nick Dawkins here. Uh, you do have an, an, impre an incredible freshman player in Cooper Cousins. He'll factor into a lot of playing time. And he can play center, guard, tackle. I think ultimately he will be a co-starter or a full-time starter by the end of the season. He is that good. He will burn his red shirt. But this Penn State offensive line is going to have to gel quickly. And right now I don't see, like again, Olu Fashino, top 15 pick. Caden Wallace, a third round pick. Hunter Norzad, a, a day three pick. Other than J.B. Nelson, I don't see a bona fide NFL draft prospect on this offensive line mm. at this given time. Penn State does have the talent there, but when is the talent actually going to show up? I, I think they will gel just fine. I think Andy Kotelnicki will help them out. But I, I, I can't, I have to admit that offensive line is concerning because I don't see another Olu Fashion. I don't see another Caden Wallace. I think J.B. Nelson is as close as it gets and everybody else is kind of there together. But they they have a future in the NFL, just not as a third, fourth, fifth, sixth-round pick. I think J.B. Nelson right now is the only one that would be draftable. Will those recruiting wins translate into developmental wins, TBD, on the mm -hmm. offensive line? Let's head over to defense. Man, was this a unit on top of a unit uh, last year that Manny Diaz was coordinating. We've already touched on it. Former Indiana head coach Tom Allen comes into a unit that still looks pretty darn good this season, but they are losing some very key pieces. How about Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac on the defensive line? How about Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, Daquan Hardy uh, in the secondary? There are some pieces that have left Happy Valley, certainly, um, this season. But when I look at that pass rush combination this season, an all-Big Ten linebacker and Abdul Carter moving to the edge on one side. You look at Dan Identis Sutton 
on to the other side. That is going to be insanely difficult to stop. Do you see this as the best Big Ten pass rush and maybe one of the best pass rush combinations in the country? I think it should be definitely up there. I, not only in the Big Ten, of course, you have JT Tui Maloa. I'm going to bring up Ohio State a lot. Like I said, they're probably yeah. my national champion pick. JT Tui Maloa and Jack Sawyer should have entered the NFL draft. They did not. They would have been, I think Tui Maloa would have been a first round pick. And I think Sawyer, depending on how he would have done at the combine and everything else, player interviews, probably would have been a second or a third round pick, third at the latest, right? Deny Dennis Sutton, Abdul Carter, you would like from Penn State's perspective, you think that they would translate. Abdul Carter, suppose some people have him in mock drafts as a future first round pick. Deny Dennis Sutton really isn't in that conversation from the national media perspective, and he should be. He's a former five star. He almost flipped to Georgia once upon a time when it was the class of 22, 2022 recruiting, and Penn State was able to retain him. Denying Dennis Sutton is going to turn it like he's turning into a true leader. His emotion, his energy is very difficult to match, but it helps raise the bar for everybody else. Like he is a different kind of person and you need that energy to inspire the rest of the team. Not that Penn State needs a lot of inspiration, but when you have somebody like that out there, it's a lot easier to get amped up at any point in the game. He is the same as he is from kickoff all the way to the final whistle, whether Penn State's up by 40, down by 40, he has that same level of intensity. So that's what Deny Dennis Sutton is. Abdul Carter's just a, uh, uh, he causes havoc. He's just a game wrecker. Wherever you can, wherever you put him, and he's up to 260 pounds. So Abdul Carter has the vision that he has, the speed that he has, the quick first step as he has, and now you put him closer to the quarterback. Now you move him to the line of scrimmage. Yeah, what do you do? What do you do? You keep the running back on one side with Deny Dennis Sutton or put him on the other side with Abdul Carter and they can play both sides of the line of scrimmage. It's not like Deny Dennis Sutton has to be attacking the right tackle. Abdul Carter has to attack the blind side. You can rotate them and then you really don't know what's going on. You can run a lot of stunts. Penn State's defensive line, unlike the offensive line, will be one of its biggest strengths, not one of its biggest question marks. You got back Devon Ellis. You got back Hakeem Beeman. They could have went into the NFL draft. They didn't. And then you add in a class of 2023 that saw a class of 2024 as well that saw all these defensive line prospects. Jameel Lyons is another name to know at the defensive end spot. They're going to end up losing Zariah Fisher to injury, but they have Amin Vanover. They have Smith Vilbert coming back. He had three sacks in the Outback Bowl once upon a time against Arkansas. So there is a lot of depth at the defensive end spot itself. And Abdul Carter and, Def and Deny Dennis Sutton are the first ones up there. And they're going to be really, really good and cause a lot of pressure. And it just makes Tom Allen's job a lot easier at the end of the day. Penn State feels very confident at linebacker despite moving an all Big Ten linebacker over mm -hmm. to the defensive line in Abdul Carter, as we just mentioned. That linebacker group includes Kobe King up there, an All-Big Ten honorable mention, 11 starts last season. Dominic DeLuca and Tony Rojas have Penn State fans very excited at that spot. Do you think that this group, some younger guys within this group, can fill the holes? Because... Those are pretty big holes to fill with Abdul Carter and, of course, Curtis Jacobs moving on to the next level. Yeah, you're banking on a lot. Linebacker is another one of those big question marks because Tony Rojas has all the potential in the world. He's bulked up to 230 pounds plus, and he still moves very well. Kobe King is the name to know. He can be all conference. I won't go as far to say that he is all America just yet, but he is going to be very good. He will be a future NFL draft prospect after this season. Kalen King, his twin brother, goes to the NFL. Kobe could have gone with him, but I think he wanted to come back and boost the draft stock. He could be a day two pick when all said and done. That's how good Kobe King is. He'll lead the team in tackles again if he stays. I have to preface it. If he stays healthy, plays a full season kind of thing. Tony Rojas has good potential. You don't make that kind of move where you take an all-conference linebacker and move him down to defensive end if you don't think that Tony Rojas and Dom DeLuca can pick up the slack. But, Ted, what I will admit is that Penn State might lean towards playing a 4-2-5. They don't mm. need to play a 4-3. I think yeah. you settle in, and then that allows you because you take away Abdul Carter. So, And they can always move him back if they need to, right? Like right. I said, they move. They have Amin Vanover. 
Zariah Fisher could come back from injury, but we'll see. He's out indefinitely. You know, whatever, you know, how long that timeline is, we don't truly know. But Smithville, Virginia Lions, right? They have other options at defensive end if they did need to move Abdul Carter back. So he's not permanently at defensive end. He can always come back to linebacker. But you run Dominic DeLuca and Kobe King as your two linebackers. KJ Winston, Jalen Reed, the guys at the safety spot almost act as that third hybrid linebacker. Ted, when we talk about this Penn State defense, yes, defensive line, Abdul Carter, Deny Dennis Sutton are important. The potential of Tony Rojas, what Kobe King can do, that's all great. But the best player overall on this defense is safety KJ Winston. It is Kevin Winston Jr., somebody who has not missed a tackle in his collegiate career, somebody that pro football focus has raved about, and he arguably might be the best safety in the Big Ten, yeah, with Caleb Downs there, and in the country. He is going to be one of the first safeties taken in next year's NFL draft. He is that good, and he has developed so well at, at Penn State when he was just kind of like, ah, he's a, he's a four-star recruit. It's not like he was a top 10 five-star. He developed very well at Penn State, and, and now it's showing. So K.J. Winston, I will st I will stand by this, is the best defender on Penn State's roster out of all the other players that we just named. Very high praise for Kevin Winston there. Uh, he also led the team in tackle 61, all Big Ten, honorable mention um, for him. Now let's move to the rest of the secondary. We talked about Jalen Reed. Uh, we talked about Kevin Winston. Uh, they brought in Jalen Kimber. They brought in A.J. Harris coming over both from SEC programs. Corner spots, right? When you lose Johnny Dixon, when you lose Kalen King, those are big losses. Kimber has a little bit more experience than Harris. Harris very highly thought of um, over there at Georgia. Had a lot of stars uh, behind, the, behind this name. Big shoes to fill. Once yes. again, do you think these guys can, you know, replacing guys like Johnny Dixon and Kalen King, that's going to be very difficult to do to really reach that type of level from 2023 to 2024. But how much do you think these guys can come in and make an impact at this corner position right away? I like A.J. Harris a lot. He's received rave reviews out of spring football camp, looked very good at the blue and white game, and he just he's living up to his potential already in just in just an offseason. I like that A.J. Harris isn't a phrase to, you know, get put his nose to the football. And that's what Penn State always looks for in that number one shutdown corner. Are you willing to go up and go after the wide receiver in the screen? Are you go willing to go up and and, and get into the pile when there's a ground and pound type of play with the running back. And A.J. Harris plays fearless. That's a good start, and he has coverage skills. He will be that number one shutdown cornerback. Penn State's going to rotate back and forth, and they, they have so many other defensive backs that they can use. Cam Miller is, is another one. Penn State likes to do this thing where they have a bona fide number one shutdown cornerback, A.J. Harris in this case, and then they'll split co-starters and have J – they'll – They'll have Jalen Kimber and Cam Miller be essentially co-starters, be a 2A and a 2B. So you have three starters at cornerback. And then I want to go back to the safety spot. So KJ Winston, you have Zach Key Wheatley, who's going to be yep. an exceptional coverage player, can play center field and be that free-ranging free safety. He can also play man. So Penn State's secondary might even be better than last year. We saw that Kalen King didn't live up to expectations. I think A.J. Harris can be better than Kalen King. I think Jalen Kimber and Cam Miller now with another year of experience can be better than Johnny Dixon. Those guys were very good, but now you have a pass rush that isn't going to take as much of a hit. Let's move to schedule. That opening game at West Virginia. Well, it's tricky, I think, to say the least. That's a good Big 12 football team over yeah, yeah. there uh, in Morgantown. How important is to it, obviously, winning the football game. You want to win, as course, as many uh, games as you can. But how important is it not only to win, but also look good doing it on the road to start the season? I have Penn State's, at, what, a 10-point favorite at this time. You know, maybe that changes – Everything I think they opened up as 12 point favorites. Mor Morgantown, I from Penn State's point of view, it is a good thing that that game is being played. Like Fox actually helped them out. And, and I will say this everyone wants to debate a big noon kickoff and everything. The football teams actually like noon kickoffs, it right. gives them the rest of the day. It's not that they don't like night games and don't like playing in it, but I, I will be the first to echo what they've told me is that the preference is to play more noon kickoff games 
the night kickoffs. Let's just get that out of the way. But from Penn State's point of view, yeah, the environment during the day at 12 is going to be a lot different than it would have been sure. at 7 30, 8 o'clock. So Penn State gets a win there. And I, I think West Virginia, I respect Garrett Green a lot as a, as a quarterback. They have, we want to talk about running back depth for Penn State. West Virginia has that and more. So, it, it, and they are going to run the football. But Penn State, Again, top five run defense in terms of yards per play a season ago. They're going to, even though they're going to run maybe more of a 4 2 5, oh, you know, there's more defensive backs on the field. Mm -hmm. AJ Harris is not afraid to cover the run. KJ Winston certainly isn't. Zach, uh, Zach Key Wheatley, Jalen Reed, any of them, those safety spots, they all act as hybrid linebackers. So they're not just defensive backs. They essentially act as half linebackers, if you will. So even though Penn State's going to run a 4-2-5, I think they will be fine. And Dom DeLuca is a run defender first. Tyler Elsden is a run defender first. We haven't mentioned him yet at the linebacker spot. Tony Rojas, Kobe King, know how to find the ball carrier. They're good at stopping the run. So I'm not concerned when West Virginia is a run first type of offense, you got to account for Garrett Green's legs but it's not like they're going to pass the ball significantly against Penn State. You take away the run, you beat West Virginia. We talked about it through this whole preview. I believe that this is a playoff roster. And also, when you look at the rest of the schedule, this seems like a playoff schedule to me. When you avoid Michigan, you get Ohio State at Beaver Stadium in Happy Valley. What are realistic expectations do you view for Penn State this season? There is limited, I, I say no precedent because Joe Paterno was coaching. These games happened in the 90s where Penn State did go out to the West Coast. But now you have this expanded Big Ten and you have plenty to talk about for your show. I, this is great for you. This is great for me, too, since Penn State is in the Big Ten Conference and whoever you know covers the SEC as well. You don't have a precedent. I don't know how a James Franklin team mm. is going to respond to flying out to Southern California in the smack middle of the season. Sure, you have the bye week, but then you go back on the road to Camp Randall and play against Wisconsin. Oh, then you come back home, play my preseason pick, essentially. I might as well state that now, since I've already praised Ohio State as much as I have. You go USC, bye week, at Wisconsin, Ohio State, and then Washington. Like, yeah. there is no let up here. People say that Penn State's schedule is easy. It is not. It is by no. far from the easiest thing that there is. I get it. They play Bowling Green. They play Kent State. West Virginia is a quality out of conference opponent, even though I'm confident that Penn State wins that game. But that five week stretch, you have U UCLA, USC, the bye week, thank goodness, at Wisconsin, <laughs> Ohio State, and then Washington. That's as difficult as it gets for a five game stretch like that. I'm looking forward to that stretch specifically uh, that you mentioned to see how Penn State can get through there. A lot of people have been thrown out 11 and 1. And could it happen? Absolutely, it could happen. I feel like anything can happen this season with all of the movement and all of the chaos right surrounding. But we'll see. We'll see. Just just don't back your just don't put your money maybe into 11 and 1 quite yet. Zach, it's always great to talk to you. It's always great to talk Penn State football, and I'm sure we'll see you down the road. Oh, thank you so much, Ted. Anytime you'd like me to uh, be on the show for that Penn State perspective, I'm always around. It's uh, great anytime we get to chat. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.